Good afternoon. Uh, good morning, sorry. Uh, again, my name is uh, Miguel Morales. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about uh, several things, mainly everything centered around molecular calculations, uh, some specifics about QMC pack, and some very general things about what's the difference between running molecules and running solids, for example. Uh, so first, uh, I'm going to start with some basics, uh, refreshing some ideas reviewing some things that maybe we have already said, and then saying some specific things about uh, calculations for molecules. So in this case, when I say molecular calculation, I mean something that's finite, any number of atoms without periodic boundary conditions. So we're going to focus most of our time on trial wave functions. Uh, we're going to see how these wave functions are actually implemented in the code, and how the derivatives are calculated, and things like that. And then. Uh, I'm going to say I have a few slides on some ideas on quantum chemistry. Uh, of course, quantum chemistry methods are large in number, and they are completely, I mean, they're very different between each other. So I'm going to say just enough so that we can do the exercises in the afternoon and that we can understand roughly what's going on uh, in the codes to generate the multi-determinants wave functions that we use. And then finally, I'm going to do a survey of some applications by not only the QMC pack group, but by other QMC groups in the world. And then I'm going to have one final slide uh, with a little bit of what I think are some interesting ideas that uh, should be worked on, especially in this area of molecular calculations. So like I mentioned today, we focus on finite systems. And tomorrow, Luke is going to spend the morning talking about solids. And what's the difference between what we say today and, and how to go from that to a solid. So. Uh, a little bit of, of background, and, and this might be a little bit of repetition between other talks, but this is a little bit of my own view. Uh, so first principles, computational physics and chemistry. From my point of view, is, is basically the idea that uh, we have a theory that's supposed to be complete. I mean, once if you're working with atoms and electrons and molecules, you should be able to extract from the Schrodinger equation any property of a material or of, of a molecule that you want. So of course, uh, the complication is that this is an extremely hard uh, equation, like we all know. So, so the art is on how to make approximations or develop methods that are powerful enough that we can actually extract meaningful information out of this equation. But if you think about it in principle, we can uh, you know, answer pretty much anything about uh, the chemistry of the problem. We can extract information about high temperatures if we want. We can extract the all sorts of information about solids. Uh, Effectively, anything that's composed of atoms and, and electrons should be contained on this equation. So the question is, how can we develop methods that are powerful enough? Uh, all of electronic structure is based on, on what's known as the von Oppenheimer approximation. I mean, most of it, I should say. Of course, even in the case where the von Oppenheimer approximation breaks, it's still the step zero in, approxi in, in, in the set of calculations. What you do is you correct the von Oppenheimer instead of typically abandon it completely. There are some methods that can work without von Oppenheimer, but there are very few, actually. Uh, so where does the von Oppenheimer, wh what is the von Oppenheimer doing? Is basically it allows us to separate the electronic and the ionic problem into two semi-independent problems. And the beauty is not that you can separate them. The beauty is that you can apply different approximations to each uh, problem. Because to solve the ionic problem, you don't need quite as much machinery and technology as you need to actually solve the electronic problem, which is much more complicated because it is fully quantum. So for example, the, the simple description of how we do this, first we start with the Schrodinger equation. Uh, the Hamiltonian at this level contains all terms, you know, contains your electron-electron interaction, your ion-ion interaction, your two kinetic energies, and your coupling between electrons and ions. Uh, and then what you do is you realize that the mass of the electrons is thousands of times smaller than the mass of the proton, and hence the mass, the mass of any ion, which means that they move thousands of times faster than the ions move. So from the point of view of the atoms, the electrons are uh, effectively always on the ground state or close to it, you can say. From the point of view of the electrons, the ions basically don't move at all. So you can make an approximation where you keep the ions frozen and you let the electrons relax. And then the, elec the ions move on the potential energy surface defined by the electronic problem, basically. And this is effectively what von Oppenheimer is doing. So if you make, uh, if you rewrite your many body Schrodinger equation like this, and it has never been shown to be exact, because uh, this would have to be continuous and smooth and differentiable, and that has never quite been uh, shown, 
Uh, but in principle, we can do it. You can separate the problem into two. One where uh, basically you are solving for all the electronic states for a given ionic configuration. And then this would generate a potential. Uh, basically, this would be like the two terms that have the electronic contribution in it. Then you get a Schrodinger equation where the solution would be eigenstates, like I say, for fixed atomic configuration. So this would define a potential energy surface where the uh, ions move, basically. And then if you look at the remaining equation for the ions, these self solutions appear as just a potential for the, for the ions. So they would have the ion ion interaction and this uh, von Oppenheimer surface. So what you then tend to do is, if the temperature is low enough, that you can just assume that the electrons are in their ground state, then you end up with just a single potential energy surface defined by the ground state of the electrons, and you can just solve that problem. So the solution of this problem we can do uh, fairly, I mean, with simple methods like Monte Carlo or molecular dynamics, like Debbie was mentioning yesterday. If, even if the ions are quantum mechanical, for example, you're doing hydrogen at low temperature, you can still incorporate uh, quantum effects by solving this equation with path integrals, for example, or any other theory that incorporates zero point energy. But you can still do it on top of the von Oppenheimer free energy surface, allowing you to keep this separation. The idea is that once we get to this problem, it's actually quite straightforward to solve. It's not really a challenge other than uh, you know, computing cycles. Obtaining the potential energy surface is where all the effort goes. And the final accuracy on whatever ionic properties we calculate depend completely on how well you're solving your, your electrons. Any, appro any different approximation will lead to a different solution of the ions. And the entire first principles field is on pushing for better and better technology from this, uh, in solving this equation and putting it on uh, something that we can actually afford whenever we solve the ions. Uh, so there are many methods uh, in the area of first principles electronic structure theory. Uh, like, I, like I mentioned before, basically the entire goal is to find better approximations to the solution of the electronic Schrodinger equation. Uh, by the way, whenever I put these brackets, I mean that it depends uh, parametrically on the configuration of the ions, but it doesn't depend as a variable. So first principles means, uh, in, in, in a sense, that we, the only input that we need in principle is the, just the position, the charges, and the number of ions. Everything else is completely determined by theory. Uh, in practice, of course, this is, depending on the method, this is not quite uh, like that, but uh, this is at, at least the goal, uh, that we don't use any form of experimental information. I mean, if you think about how things were done maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago, it was completely the opposite. Uh, we, we could not touch the electrons back then. You would have to, well, the royal we, of course, I wasn't even born. But uh, the idea is that you generate a, a form of a potential, then you solve this potential for the ion, and using experimental information, you would adjust the potential to give you back whatever information you, you could observe experimentally on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the system. Of course, this meant that you could only use this potential whenever you could validate it experimentally, or you would need to know what the uh, answer is before you can kind of build it. Uh, in on the system. The idea of free first principles, of course, is to completely get away from that and solve the problem entirely within a theoretical framework. This allows you many things. I mean, you can go into places where there's no experiment whatsoever. Uh, and you can do things that experimentally are much more complicated. So the goal, I, I would say from my point of view, in this area is to eventually get to a place where you can, you don't quite need experiment. Can you just, uh, where is the DW So GW is a way, is, is a perturbation, it, GW is basically perturbation theory for optical properties. At, at this point, that's the way that it's used. So once you, the typical way that GW would be used is actually, it, it doesn't get down here. It's typically done in some sort of approximation where you, you know what this, you're typically doing solids, for example, and you know what the structure of the solid is. So you don't, you don't need to solve this, this you, don't get to, you don't need to get to this level within a given, uh, position of the ions, then what you do is you do mean field theory with density functional theory, and GW would be a perturbative correction on top of this. So whenever you do GW, uh, whenever you do DFT, optical properties are typically very poor because of self-interaction. GW allows you to correct for these deficiencies to second order, I mean in formal terms is, is RPA and screen coulomb potential. So it, it basically allows you to fix up, to correct some of the uh, deficiencies in orbital properties, so in optical properties. So maybe in your next slide, Sure, yeah. So, so, That's all I 
Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, so of course, th th this is just uh, w these are the three that would fit into this scheme of getting all the way down here. GW. Th there are many, many more. If you consider GW a level of theory, then you have to put RPA and many, many, many other things. But that could still fall under the first one with perturbation. Sure. Sure. Of course. Yeah. Well, there is a difference. GW can't easily compute energy. Right. Cram state energies. Right. Although so. It's quite terrible, actually, if, yeah. you, if you just look at energetics. So GW, uh, I, I don't think that you could ever use it to actually drive the, the first principle concept of solving the ions. But, but it's a very useful method, I, I, I agree. Uh, so I, I'm focusing at this point mostly on, on what would allow you to eventually solve the ions uh, with, basically. So uh, and these, of course, are, are only the, the three main categories. And uh, of course, there are many more. And, uh, there's the not enough time to dis describe them all, but these are the two that couple m better with QMC. So I would focus on them. So uh, density functional theory, like I, I assume most of you have heard of, uh, it's a very successful theory, m much more successful than people thought in the beginning, I would say. And the idea is that it's still a mean field theory. It's, it's effectively uh, approximating or modeling exchange and correlation effects into the system. Uh, it's it's exact in principle, uh, but of course in practice uh, it's exact only in the limit that we would be able to calculate something that, that we are in practice not able to. So uh, the, 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 the game in, in uh, what people do in density functional theory is improve approximations for exchange and correlation and then test it typically using uh, experimental data or higher levels of theory. So th the, the benefits of course are its, it's mean field. So the cost is actually quite reasonable compared to, to what you are getting. So I, I from the, the way I typically say it is the ratio of accuracy to cost is, is quite high uh, in, in, the t in, in first principles sense. There it's a, there's a very large community, so there are very well developed codes. You c these days you can go from not knowing anything to getting numbers uh, you know, in a very short amount of time because the codes are very robust. And it's... Uh, I would say easy to learn, maybe not everybody agrees, but compared to the, to the other two alternatives, DFT is actually quite straightforward if you think about it. Uh, and it's, it's very amenable to high performance computing, so you can run on very large clusters. You can, these days you can probably do tens of, maybe hundreds of thousands of atoms. So, so you can dream a little bit about what the field is gonna be in a few, in a few years, and it's gonna be pretty interesting. The negative side of density functional theory is that it's very hard to improve. Uh, like I said, we are basically making a model for exchange and correlation. And this model, if you really want it to be accurate everywhere, it would have to be able to differentiate an ionic solid from an insulator, from a metal, from a strongly correlated system, from a spin order system. It would have to encapsulate all the physics. And this is, of course, way too much to ask. So I there is no systematic route that even if I had infinite computing time I could use to make a functional better other than trying new things. I mean, it, it's co there's no systematic route really to improvement, which is, I would say, the, 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 the biggest problem in DFT. So of course, the accuracy to some degree is unknown in principle. In practice, you know because you test it. But when you're building a function, you really have no clue how good it's going to do, especially when, when you're using it in places where you didn't quite design the function to, to work on. And, and it fails for correlated problems in the sense that it's a, it's a mean field theory. So if correlation is critical, and uh, I'm using the word correlation and exchange uh, kind of uh, casually, if you have questions about what these things mean, please stop me and ask me. Uh, otherwise, I would kind of keep uh, going with this language. But I, 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 I'm, I can do any explanation if, if, if there are problems with, with the terms that I'm using. Uh, but basically, it fails for correlation problems because it's, it's a mean field theory. So if correlation is critical, if the non-interacting system is very poor and not close at all to the real many-body system, which is the, def the definition of strong correlation, then mean field would really not be able to give you a proper description. Uh, the functional, we would be asking too much of this functional that we are building, basically. Then you have quantum chemistry methods, which is the completely opposite end of the spectrum. In quantum chemistry, the problems are small enough that we can hit them with the big hammer, so to speak. We can use really brute force technology and, and really get really, really high accuracy on small problems. Uh, again, this is a very large community, so that it, among the benefits, other than being very accurate and typically very robust, 
uh, it's so there's also very well developed codes and the theory is, is very involved and developed so you can uh, if the molecule is small enough you can effectively get exact answers uh, these days the problem is that the cost is really high so the cheapest of the quantum chemistry methods is mp2 and uh, it costs it goes as n to the fifth in its canonical implementation you can Im improve it but uh, so uh, i'm not going to go into that if you want to do something like couple cluster, which is considered the, the gold standard in quantum chemistry, it offers by far the best ratio of accuracy to cost. It's n to the seventh in its accurate implementation, which is when you have to do perturbative tri triplets. So of course, n to the seventh is not something that you can really afford. So uh, in practice, you can only do quite small molecules. There are great advances in this field, I should say. Now you can do hundreds of atoms, actually, if you do proper approximations. But, but it's still uh, limited to finite systems. Uh, the jump to solids is still very far away. And in practice, it cannot really do, if you're doing couple cluster, for example, it cannot really do uh, co really correlated systems either. Uh, like I would maybe uh, mention in, the, in, the in a few slides. So like I said, it's very hard for solids. And uh, one of the weak sides also is that it's, right now it's not implemented in HPC. You cannot get a couple cluster code that would run in, in thousands, of course which limits also the applicability. So finally, we have quantum Monte Carlo, which in a sense, it's, it's somewhere between the two. So it is accurate. Uh, we can show that if, if you work on the wave function, uh, you can get results that are as good as couple cluster. Uh, it's improvable, which is a very important aspect. Uh, basically, if you want more accuracy and you have more computing time, you can, you can get the accuracy with sort of straightforward steps, basically. It's not, it's not always straightforward, but basically, you can get it. It's trivially parallelizable, so we can go, uh, basically we can run in the largest machines. We have scaling data for QMC pack on a million processors, for example, and it scales perfectly well. And uh, the scaling with number, with system size is not terrible. It's n cubed, n to the four, depending on which method you're using. Uh, but it's still affordable, it's not n to the seven, for example. We can do solids, we can do molecules, we can kind of do everything. Uh, the problem is that, uh, there's a high cost. So even though I say that the scaling is n cubed, the prefactor is actually quite large. Uh, there's a human uh, time intensive, which by this mean, I mean that this is, this is getting better and better, but the intervention from the user, it's much higher than typically in something like density functional theory, where you just say, give me PBE or give me LDA and go, and every, everything is decided for you. Uh, in the case of quantum Monte Carlo, you have to make a lot of decisions that affect the accuracy. Uh, there's a typical saying, I mean, if you put make bad, I mean, whatever you put in, you get back. If you put in bad decisions, you're going to get very bad answers. So it depends a lot on knowing and understanding what's happening. What is G? Uh, ch nuclear charge. Quantum. Yeah, atomic charge, yeah. So th the other problem is that the community is quite small. There are five, six, seven groups in the world. So the development is actually somewhat slow uh, and not necessarily correlated, I would say. Uh, typically, it takes a long time from development in one group to it spread to the others. But that's, that's the, the nature of research. And currently, there is, there's some issues with high C related to the pseudopotential. So I, I'm going to say a few things about the pseudopotentials that are used in chemistry. But tomorrow, Luke is going to talk in more detail about how you actually evaluate the non-local pseudopotentials in QMC. And so right now, uh, uh, there, there is an approximation that you get whenever you do non-local pseudopotentials. It's called the locality approximation. And right now, we are having issues with this approximation when we go all the way down to the periodic table. So we cannot really do things like actinides at this point. Uh, so the, the question is how we determine how many electrons we put in a pseudopotential. And, and typically, you go by chemical intuition if the problem is simple enough. Uh, the typically the easiest thing that you would do, you would go to the previous uh, closed shell, for example. But you have to look at this uh, spatial extent of the whatever your next shell is. And if the spatial extent is such that it overlaps significantly with the valence states, this would be called semi-core states. And typically, you would want to include them also, which would increase your computation. Of course, so there is always a, a balance between how important they are and how much the cost would be. Depe it's very system dependent, uh, I would say. So if you're do doing transition metals, for example, and you're, you're studying uh, things that are quite spread in space, uh, and at the same time you have localized these states, then you have to be very careful in to making this decision about what you put into the, into the balance and what you keep on the core. Uh, but this would not be unique to Monte Carlo. This would be unique to any method 
that would apply a, an approximation to the core that would remove core electrons through a pseudopotential. So it would be exactly the same in DFT and it would be exactly the same in quantum chemistry. This is more about the chemistry of the problem. I completely agree, yeah, especially if, of course, it's not necessarily easy to dream, but if you, s if you see how, if you compare to how things were in the past, especially with DFT, we are uh, roughly where DFT was some decades ago where things had to be very carefully decided because the computer power was not quite there yet. And now DFT is, is straightforward. So hopefully, we, you know, in 10 years, things are such that we, you know, don't have to worry about any of these details and we just go through, I mean, the calculation. I completely agree. Uh, yes. Can you say something? Can you say that again, sir? Uh, I, I don't understand what, what you mean, so sorry. You talk about exchange and correlation. Yes. So can we say exchange is just some kind of correlation? Uh, sure, exchange is a type of correlation, a very, a very specific type of correlation. So that we typically call it uh, by, by a specific name, but, but it completely, that's completely true, yeah. Exchange could be lumped in, in, in correlation. I mean, the, 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 the thing is that correlation is a very subtle concept because it depends on what your reference is. It's the difference between the, the reference energy and the exact energy. And the reference energy, in principle, can be anything. So if we go by the Ludin definition, we would take the RHF state as the reference, but, but you, can, you don't have to do, to do that, basically. Uh, so I'm going a little bit slow in the beginning, and I'm going to start speeding up. Uh, so YQMC, uh, if you're, like David said, if you're here, uh, I'm assuming that I wouldn't have to go too much into this, but I, I will say a few things. Uh, first, uh, it's, if you think about it, stochastic methods are the way to solve classical many-body problems. Uh, stochastic, uh, if you have a, a collection of atoms and you know the potential, there's no question that you can solve this problem. You just run Monte Carlo or molecular dynamics. Uh, we cannot do the same in fermions, so the, the whole dream of the field, I would say, that the, the, the place people want to aim at is to develop a method that would be exactly equi equivalent, where if we were to solve the, the fixed uh, design problem somehow, we would have a method that would give us solutions for to fermion problems in the same way that we think about solutions in, in classical problems. So it is a natural thing to, to, to think about. Uh, the method also works for, it's, n it's, that it's not that we cannot handle exchange symmetry, it's a negative sign that we cannot handle. So bosons, effectively, you can solve exactly with these numerical methods. Uh, so some strength of the problem, uh, of the method. Basically, it's, it's we're solving the many body problem directly. So we already avoid the limitations with DFT and mean field where you have to approximate the Hamiltonian in some way, basically. So if you think about it in DFT, we actually change the Hamiltonian. And, and it's an empirical change to, to, to a large part. So in this case, we're not making any such approximation. We're treating electronic correlation directly. And most methods, I would say, not, not everything, but most methods are variational, which allows us a systematic way to improve, like I already said. So I in a sense, it's a, pre it's a framework. At, at this point, it's not exact, but it's really a framework for exact or at least very accurate results. The weaknesses are basically the same, that since you're dealing with the many-body problem, you're basically going all the way to, 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 the, to the exact solution, in a sense. There's no way to, to approximate the problem in such a way that you get a simpler problem, but you still fa have something specific to solve. Uh, this, this, this actually makes the problem very hard to simplify. For example, removing the core, uh, in, uh, you know, putting symmetry in, is not quite as straightforward. And, and also, size effects in solids are quite strong, like, like uh, Luke is going to talk about this uh, in more detail tomorrow. Uh, 
we should realize that size effects will be strong in any many body method, by the way. The problem is that there are so few many body methods that can work directly on solids that we don't quite realize it. But uh, this is really not a problem with, the, with QMC. This is a problem with doing many body physics in, in a periodic solid. DFT doesn't have these issues because it's mean field. The, 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 the correlation energy depends on the system size when you do many body. It doesn't in DFT because David already took care of that 30 years ago. So Luke uh, will talk more about that tomorrow. So uh, before going into more details about uh, molecular calculations, I, I just wanted to say what's the basic workflow whenever you use uh, QMC pack, and, and it's actually very straightforward. Uh, as we will see in, in the afternoon, the converter takes care of effectively all the work. Uh, you do need to know how to use the, the, the quantum chemistry package that, that's driving, that's creating the wave function. So of course, that's, that's something that an extra piece of work. But if you know how to use games, for example, basic functionality, which is actually very straightforward, you can go from a games input to an QMC pack input with just a single, uh, a single routine a call to the converter. So uh, for example, this would be, uh, so, th so th the workflow would be you run games, you evaluate, the you run the converter with the game's output, and that would give you all, everything that you need basically to start optimizing the wave function and eventually doing VMC and DMC. So with five steps, you can go from, with four steps, you can go from games to a converged DF DMC calculation. And uh, so for example, this, this, the whenever, if you just collect the standard output from a game's calculation, uh, just doing a, a simple call to the converter and uh, just defining that you're using games input would take care of everything. This would generate the wave function file, the particle set file, and the only thing that you would need is an, an optimization block, for example. And I, like I tried to allude yesterday, the optimization VMC and DMC blocks are, are very standard. They, they basically don't change at all. The, there are three or four numbers that you need to change, which are typically time step, number of walkers, and samples in the optimization. And with these three decisions, you can pretty much do any molecular calculation. So, so the main point is that this is, this is very straightforward and, and user-friendly, I would say. So let's, let's talk a little bit more in detail about what are, uh, how do you do molecular calculations in MC pack. Uh, the first thing that we have to think about is, is the, the potential. Uh, so basically, we, we, of course, we want to start with the Coulomb potential, 1 over r between electrons and ions. This, in practice, uh, it, it's too much in some sense. I mean, we, we don't need to solve a problem all the way using the Coulomb potential and including core electrons because they're typically inert in chemical uh, processes. So the, what you do is you remove the core electrons and you replace, you, of course, you have to modify the potentials because the valence, uh, the, the potential that the valence sees is not really one over R, it's some screen version of one over R because there are a bunch of core electrons uh, uh, screening the, the nuclear potential. So the, the typical form, uh, in, by the way, in, in solid state, they're called pseudopotentials. Exactly the same thing is called effective core potential in chemistry. So I go by the chemistry notation, but uh, things are slightly different, but the, the idea is exactly the same. And the way they're constructed are typically exactly the same also. So uh, an effective core potential has a local piece and a non-local piece, which is defined through uh, spherical harmonic projections on the wave function. The, the, the form of, of any, these are both rate of functions, the form of these two potentials uh, in the chemistry community is just a, an expansion in Gaussians. Gaussians are extremely popular in chemistry, um, and I would say why now? And, and, of, and then you have uh, powers of R in between. So a rate of function would literally be just some straight up expansion in Gaussians, which you can read. Uh, the, the way that this works is you have people who develop these pseudo potentials, and then they just, beat, uh, they just give these tables of coefficients that you can use to generate the potentials. Uh, there are, so in practice, generating these potentials is, is a very complicated process and you don't want to do it yourself by far unless you're an expert. So what you do is you go to their well-known libraries, you go to one of these libraries and you gather and you grab not only the potential but also the basis set that accompanies the potential and I would say more about that soon. Uh, so like I said, Luke is gonna talk about pseudo potentials tomorrow so I'm not gonna repeat what he's gonna say. But in chemistry, in the case of chemistry, calculations, finite molecules, there are two very well-known uh, databases of pseudopotentials, and they are well tested, uh, I would say. So of course you have to do a little bit of testing on your own, depending on which conditions you want to use. But in practice, to first order, you can just go to these websites, grab a pseudopotential, and start doing calculations right away. Uh, one of them is the 
Burkatsi Filippi Dolk set of pseudopotentials. So in this case, Dolk is, is a very famous guy in, in the pseudopotential community in chemistry. He developed with uh, Claudia Filippi and uh, I don't know his first name, Burkatsi. They developed a, a, an entire set of pseudopotentials for everything except this block of the transition metals, especially designed for QMC. By specially designed for QMC, I mean that the, this local potential is not divergent in their pseudopotentials. It's soft, similar to pseudopotentials uh, uh, in, in, uh, in DFT. And the reason why we do that is to avoid having to directly work with cost conditions uh, for the ions. It makes things uh, a little bit simpler and the, and the fluctuations in the core are, are better. And then the, the, the other big QMC code that exists, uh, the casino code, they have their own pseudopotential database. And there are converters, like uh, I believe or have already been uh, described, that can go from their format to our format very straightforwardly. So uh, in both cases, you can grab both the potential and the, and, the, and the basis sets. So as of this point, are there any questions? Any, anything that needs to be discussed further? Uh, just one question. Uh, if I would like to do the three uh, of the all electron composition, well, what's the difficulty? Why, why is it so common to use? So there are there's several difficulties, especially in QMC. So, th so th the easiest one is you have more electrons, and these electrons are really not doing anything useful to the chemistry. So from the point of view of if the pseudopotential is constructed correctly, you should get the same answer. If you're do chain doing you know, binding energies and things like that, the core electrons really don't, don't matter. So from that point of view, this is already something to consider. But from a technical point of view, the problem is really the fact that the pseudopotential, if you think about it, the local energy, uh, the wave function would have to be really, really, really accurate near the core because otherwise the fluctuations are, are set by the scale of your potential. So if your potential is really deep, and of course in the Coulomb potential it diverges all the way to minus infinity, the fluctuations are going to be equally large based on how off your wave function is. So if your wave function is just a little bit off, this would induce fluctuations that would be on the scale of the, of the potential energy. So you can think of the, effectively in practice, the error bars in all electron calculations are much larger, basically. You need a lot more computing time to drive down the error bar because the variance of the local energy is much larger. And uh, you have to be really careful how you build wave functions to make sure that the cusp is perfect. If the cusp is not perfect, you are going to have really large error bars. So it's, it's purely a technical reason from the point of view of, of, uh, of QMC. And there might be other things that I cannot really think about at this point. So there are some all electron calculations, not to say this is mean that it's never done, but it's typically restricted to tests, basically, and to demonstrations. It's, it's really unlikely to find production level, actual science being done with all electron, with the exception of hydrogen. We do all the hydrogen all electrons, so we're happy there. And uh, maybe helium, lithium, something like that. But after lithium, it, it's really not necessary, I would say. So trial functions. Uh, I'm going to go into a lot of detail about the different forms of trial wave functions typically used in Monte Carlo. The main thing, and what I want to drive down, is that, and I think I said this yesterday, as long as you can evaluate these three things, uh, and if you want to optimize them, these other three things, you can use it. This is, this is in principle, the, the, the goal and, and one of the benefits of QMC. So if you can evaluate the wave function, the first derivative, the gradients, and the, and the second derivatives, the Laplacians, and the derivative with respect to any variation of parameter of the centric quantities, you can use it. So if you go and you start reading some book and you realize, oh, this is a very fantastic wave function that nobody has tried, I can do these six operations, you can put it in the code and you can use it and you can uh, become important in the field. So yes. This guy? Yeah. So, uh, It, it doesn't matter. You can build the local energy either way. So I if you do, if you expand this operation on the log, you would get the Laplacian of the wave function over psi minus the gradient squared. So if you have this, you can just, by subtracting or adding the square of this, you can get the local energy regardless of whether you could do the logarithm or the, or the Laplacian of the wave function. But there's no reason why you put that on there. Yeah, because it separates the determinant piece from the gesture piece. And also, the gesture is usually a sum like Right. Electron, electron, electron. The sum, the log, it becomes a sum. So it's a linear. Right. It takes a derivative. Well, like so it makes the code easier organized like that. Right. If, if you do it without the log, then the gesture needs to know about the determinant and needs to know about everything. If you, if you do it through the log, 
it's a sum of pieces that you can just uh, keep adding on top of each other. And one piece of the code doesn't need to know anything about the other piece of the code. So that you have a teacher that can choose those terms. And then you, you can have a master that just puts, brings them all together right. without knowing where they came right. from. So from a from a design point of view, this this is this is this needs to be there, but in practice, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Oh, because I depending on which method you're using, you might need the grading of the local energy, and and then you would need this piece because the local energy has this term, and you would need the derivative of that with respect to the variation of parameter. Uh, so if you're doing, for example, the, the linear method, the, the, the overlap, uh, the, the H bar terms, the ma matrix elements of the Hamiltonian with respect to the derivatives, there is one term that, con that will contain this. So actually, unless, and if you do the, the Newton method, you also need it. So in practice, you, all the good optimization methods would have this piece in it. Uh, it's, it's fairly straightforward to code, actually, so it's not, uh, it's not a big deal. And notice that it's a single derivative of the variation of parameter, which is important. If you had mixed derivatives, then, then this becomes a challenge, actually. But as long as you keep it linear, it's fine. Uh, OK. Jesus. OK. So basis sets for molecules. Uh, in, in molecular calculations, basis sets are uh, ubiquitous, uh, of course. So if you think about it in plane wave calculations, the plane wave is the basis set. The, the whole appeal of the plane wave is that you don't have to worry about the basis set. You just say a number, cut my plane wave somewhere, and you're done. In the case of molecules, it's very different. So of course, a plane wave is complete, but it's, it's too generic in some sense. You cannot really tailor it to a problem. What they do in chemistry is different. Yet they use uh, LC, LACO local combination of atomic orbitals to build uh, basis sets that are as close to the final solution as they possibly can. So they work really hard on solving the atom and generating orbitals that look as much as possible to the orbitals in the atom. And then they add things on top for the cases where you're going to have a bonding and things like that. So the, the, the mentality is completely different. The mentality is really try to start with a set of orbitals that, that would help you as much as you possibly can and to keep the number of orbitals as small as possible. Because everything in quantum chemistry scales at some very high power of the number of orbitals, uh, of, of basis sets, sorry. So the, the general uh, expansion is, is, of course, centered around the atoms. So uh, you always expand with respect to how far away you are from, from the ions. And you would have a sum over all ions and a sum over all terms in your expansion. Uh, typically, if you want really, really accurate solutions, as I will show soon, uh, this th all the properties decay very slowly with, uh, w not all, but they de decay quite slowly with, uh, with the number of basis sets. So, so you're typically going to need anywhere between 20 and 30 basis functions for atom if you want really high quality calculations. In QMC, we, we don't quite need as much, but uh, I'll go into that in a little bit. Uh, there are two very popular uh, basis functions. So uh, you have Slater type orbitals, which are basically designed after hydrogenic-like orbitals, where you're, uh, eff effectively you have uh, co linear combinations of exponents instead of Gaussians, and some uh, spherical harmonics uh, to represent the radial components. And of course, you have Gaussian-type orbitals, which is the same idea, but now you have a Gaussian instead of, uh, of an exponential. And you, can, you have them in two flavors, because you can go back and forth between spherical harmonics and just uh, polynomials of the XYZ. Uh, these are typically called spherical, and, and these are typically called Cartesian um, basis functions. So Gaussians are by far the most popular basis set. And the reason is very simple, because in when, when you have Gaussians, you can do all the integrals analytically. You don't need to do any numerical evaluation of uh, matrix elements. So you typically have a, a quantum chemistry code where 90% of the effort is uh, involved in how fast you can do all these analytical derivatives uh, uh, all these analytical uh, matrix elements, basically. And you use iterative routines. There, there's a, a lot of technology built into getting these things as, as quick as possible. But everything is done analytically. And then once you have these matrix elements, you can go and do linear algebra, typically, to solve the actual quantum chemistry problem. So the problem is that Gaussians ha are, are very poor at describing the origin. Uh, of course, if you think about it, the wave function should have a cusp. It should, uh, have a, it should be very sharp in the 
in the origin and the Gaussians are zero derivative. So you, you actually need to, to use linear combinations of many Gaussians with very, sh uh, very big exponents to, to get the, the proper shape of the orbital close to the nucleus. So in, in general, uh, Gaussian type orbitals lead to, to more basis functions in a calculation than Slater type orbitals. But in the case of Slater type orbitals, you cannot do three and four body matrix elements analytically. You, you have to go and do numerical evaluations, which makes everything very slow. So by far, these, these are the most uh, used. By the way, in QMC pack, we don't care. Uh, we transform them anyway. It doesn't really matter how you represent the radio function. Uh, in the way the code should be used, although it can be used in many different ways, it actually takes all of these functions and evaluates them in a numerical grid. And we use splines actually to do evaluations. Uh, typically cubic splines, but we also have quintic as splines in case we need third order derivatives. Uh, so the evaluation is much faster. The code is a lot cleaner because, of course, we have a single generic universal uh, representation. And we can do both Cartesian and solid harmonics. A uh, little bit more about basis sets. So considerable effort has been put, like I say, in chemistry in, in making the basis sets that are, are as good as they're going to be for a generic calculation. There are, I don't really have time right now to go into all the details so on how these things are built. But effectively, what they do is uh, they, they name the basis set based on how many functions per valence electron they have. And then they design the basis sets in such a way that for an atom, each time you add a new set of basis functions, you, you typically get much closer to the exact solution at, at the level of theory they're using to, to build. So if you were to do a, a plot of the energy versus the cardinal number, and the cardinal number is how many basis functions per balance electrons you have, you have a, a nice decreasing function of the error as a function of this cardinal number. Uh, there are many to name, frankly, uh, and they all have you know, well-known names. For example, the most famous by far is the correlation consistent basis sets of Dunning. Uh, and this came on something somewhere in the 90s. And this, he was the one that started with the idea of, of having uh, the basis set tailored for correlation energy. And uh, so the typical uh, naming convention would be CCPVXC for correlation consistent polarized valence X uh, valence. Uh, so the X would be any, uh, typically D, T, Q, C for D, two, three, four, or five, so forth, basis functions for, for valence electron. Uh, there are many other, for example, the Popple basis sets are very popular and they're really old. Uh, actually, a lot of people have worked on this, so uh, it's not the, the idea was by Popple, but every other people have done a lot of work and they're typically like 6, 3, 1G and so forth. Uh, by far, we typically recommend just using correlation consistent. Uh, anyway, so uh, if you generate, if you take the pseudo potentials from the well known libraries, they give you basis that's already specifically designed for those pseudo potentials, so you don't have to worry too much about it. The only thing you have to worry is the concept of convergence with cardinal number. So this is a famous paper showing the original design of the correlation consistent basis sets. And in this case, you can see how the convergence, so this is the convergence of the uh, binding energy of, mole of several molecules. And this is the convergence of the equilibrium distance in the molecule. Is the convergence of the harmonic frequencies of, of the molecule. I think it's NO2, the molecule they chose, as a function of uh, the cardinal number in the basis set. So of course, we only get the exact basis set solution in, in some limit where we have a complete resolution of the identity, which is typically called the complete basis set limit. And the whole point is to see how big we have to go to get very close to this basis set limit. So for these properties, you can see that uh, typically, we need somewhere between quadruple and quintuple zeta to, to have uh, accurate solutions. Uh, some things converge faster, some things converge uh, smaller. For example, the frequencies are notoriously hard to converge because they're a second derivative. Uh, in this case, this is actually much better than it would be for the total energy. This is the binding energy, so you're subtracting out the, uh, the energy of the atom. If you were to just look at the energy of the molecule, the convergence would be a lot slower. So typically, even quintuple zeta is still some number of millihartree away from, be, from, the com from the basis set limit. So what you do is you, um, there have been a lot of analysis on how the energy should change as a function of basis set. And it's pretty well understood now that hartree fock since there is no correlation, and correlation is the tricky part, and I will show why in the next slide, uh, hartree fock converges actually exponentially fast. So uh, if, if you do a few points and fit it to an exponential, you can get a very reliable value of the hartree fock uh, energy. The, cor the correlation piece, is actually is converging typically as the inverse cube of the cardinal number. 
So you have to, what people do is you have to do two to three calculations and, and feed a function like this. Uh, and, and then that, that way you have some sort of extrapolation to the basis cell limit, but then the problem is that you have to do this for every quantity independently. Uh, okay, Slater determinants. Uh, everything uh, in, in, in quantum chemistry and in QMC-PAC, as we will see, is, is typically built, the anti-symmetric piece is, is built out of determinants or linear combinations of determinants. So what is a determinant? Uh, first of all, we build, and this is quite small, so you might have to look in, in the site, and I apologize for that. Uh, we, we build this later matrix, which is uh, this matrix right here, where it uh, doesn't really matter which order you do it, but orbitals vary along one way, and electron coordinates vary along the other. And so you would have n orbitals and n electronic coordinates, and you build a matrix out of evaluating the two of them. If you take the determinant of that, that would lead to, to the Slater determinant. So this would be the real space representation of the Slater determinant. This matrix is, is very important, of course. Everything depends on, on this matrix. Uh, the evaluation of gradients is pretty straightforward. If, uh, if you know the inverse of the Slater matrix, you can actually build the gradients uh, pretty quickly. But of course, building the inverse by itself is, is an expensive thing. It's order n cube. Uh, but if you know the inverse, then you can evaluate any gradient in order n time. It's just a vector-vector -vector multiplication, one column of the inverse and one uh, row of this matrix, depending on your convention. Uh, and of course, to get the gradients of all the particles, it would be order n squared. The Laplacian is, is the same if you know the inverse then it's order n to get the Laplacian of the Slater determinant and order n squared to get all of the Laplacians. So the typical strategy that we use in QMC is to, uh, the idea that we calculate the inverse once in the beginning of the calculation and every time we move a, a, an electronic move, instead of recalculating the inverse, we just do an particle, a single particle update to the inverse. You can show that if only one column of the, of the Slater matrix is changing, then you can update the inverse of the matrix with a uh, order n square operations. So uh, basically what you do between every move, you move, only, you, you move only one electron, you update the inverse, and then you can calculate gradients and Laplacians in, in a very quick fashion. So I, I say that now Slater determinants, you need to choose n orbitals. Uh, I did not say how you choose these n orbitals. So of course the Hartree-Fock determinant Whenever you do a, a let's say, Hartree-Fock calculation, the Hartree-Fock determinant is defined as once you have a, a, a set of molecular orbitals as occupying the bottom n orbitals in, in your orbital set. The, the lowest energy you can show is always obtained by occupying an in, in, this, in this diagram, which is taken from a nature paper by George Booth, by the way, because I like the diagram a lot, uh, and I didn't have to remake it. Uh, so you have occupied in red and unoccupied or virtual in blue. So of course the Slater determinant is what you get by occupying all the bottom orbitals. You can create excitations, which would be ex the exact excitations of your non-interacting system by just putting uh, electrons from the occupied, basically raising them from the occupied sector to the unoccupied sector. And if, for example, if you take the top orbital and you put it on the bottom unoccupied, that would be your, small, your, 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 your first excited state, for example. You can do this with two electrons at a time, you can do it with three electrons at a time, with as many electrons as you want. And uh, of course, if you do this process in the limit where you consider all possible ways of putting n electrons in m orbitals, where m is the total number of orbitals into your system, you can represent any anti-symmetric function explicitly written in terms of these orbitals. So, so the, the Slater determinants are a basis, a basis for the many-body Hilbert space on a given set of, of orbitals, in a given uh, orbital matrix uh, manifold. So, in principle, if we consider all possible Slater determinants, we have in there a way of finding the exact solution. The problem is that the number is combinatorial. If you think about how many ways you can, this is the, the standard definition of combinatorics, how many ways to put n things in m choices, basically. This leads to a, an exponentially large number, which is the big problem of CI calculations. And uh, so, but at least we understand the notation. I'm going to go, go back to this idea of single excitations, double excitations, as, and we need to remember that it's you take one, two, some number of uh, electrons from the occupied state and you put them somewhere in the virtual. And by counting how many times you excite, you know how you, you basically have your, your, your notation. 
So configuration interaction, which is my first, uh, I'm going to be talking about quantum chemistry along the way in, in, instead of piling it up at the end because we just talked about determinants, it's better to do it right now. And we need this for the, for the tutorial. So configuration interaction is the idea that you have a basis set, like I just said, for many body calculations by using determinants. So you can build, uh, you can use this basis and solve the Hamiltonian on this basis set. On this, this is the basis set for the many body, ham for the many body Hamiltonian, not just for single electron states. So in this case, you would write your wave function as a linear combination of determinants. And each one of these i's represent one of the combinatorial possibilities, which is typically extremely large. Then you build the matrix element of the Hamiltonian between any two determinants, which would be a matrix with exponentially large dimension, and you solve the eigenvalue problem in this huge space. And with this, you would get the exact solution within this basis set. So full CI is considered the exact solution within a given basis set, of course. Uh, this is, of course, too expensive, and it can only be done in small systems. Uh, th there are stochastic ways of doing this these days, and they are actually quite interesting, but still, it only raises a little bit what system size you can afford. It's still exponential. Uh, the, the typical way you do, uh, you actually use the method, is by truncating the expansion. So instead of using all the determinants in the system, you restrict the determinants to some class, for example. And which, how you do the restriction defines what type of CI method you are using. So the, by far the, the, the most well-known case is truncated CI. Truncated CI, typically you truncate it by excitations. So you do, your wave function now contains all determinants, but only the hard to fog, and you can do single excitations, double excitations, and so forth. And where you stop defines the name. So if you do CISD, configuration interaction singles and doubles, you're including all single and all double excitations of your hardware fox state, and then you solve this eigenvalue equation on this reduced basis. And you can keep including higher and higher excitations, and this will lead to better and better answers. It's still scaling quite poorly. So it scales as n to the fourth plus how many excitations you put. So CISD scales as n to the sixth. Uh, the reason why this method is actually not quite popular is there are two reasons. It's not size extensive. And uh, if I can explain what that is quickly, it would be useful. So think about having, think about the exercise of having uh, two molecules together and then bringing those molecules completely apart and completely unrelated with each other. When they're together and you're doing single and double excitations, you're considering ex excitations of a double of the combined system. When you bring them apart and you now do each calculation independently, you're doing single excitations and double excitations independently on each molecule. So in the independent case, you can have all, all the way to quadruple excitations if you were doing them together, side by side, because you can excite two from that side and two from that side. In the combined system, you can only excite two. So you can either do two from this or two from this or one from each. So the type of determinants that you were to get by, com by doing the system separately is much bigger than the type of determinants that you were to do if the system is joined together. If you keep making the system larger and larger and larger, the effective set of determinants that you are including compared to breaking everything apart is very, very tiny. So in configuration interaction, the amount of correlation energy uh, that you gain, the fraction of the correlation energy that you gain goes down with system size. In an infinite system, configuration interaction is, is kind of useless. By this, I mean that every determinant has an exponentially small contribution to the total wave function. So this is one of the big problems. The other big problem is that couple cluster appear and completely blew this out of the park. Couple cluster is size extensive Sorry. and wonderful. What is actually the problem with that? Because you're saying the combined system is smaller. The, uh, the meaning of a double excitation in the combined system is a lot smaller than the meaning of a double excitation in, in, in the separate system. So, so is it only a problem if you're looking at dissociation chemistry? Uh, but basically, you can use this argument to show that the fraction of correlation energy that you're getting is going down with system size. So I in principle, if you, this is the concept of size extensivity. I have a system, and I double it in size. My correlation energy should roughly be twice. But if you do CI, the correlation energy that you're getting is much less than what you were getting before. So the correlation energy is increasing linearly. In the real system, the correlation energy that you get with co configuration interaction is staying roughly the same. So the ratio of correlation energy that you're getting is going to zero in the limit of a large system. There are a lot more crystals than there are surfaces. Yeah. There are, more combinations. there are many more combinations in the real system. Is the so what do you... They will contribute a lot less 
Yes, so the only way to get its size consistent is to keep increasing the number of excitations as you increase the system. So if you do doubles, then you have to do quadruples for twice and so forth, and then you very quickly uh, cannot afford it. So this is still very useful in, in many things, but for the point of view of correlati calculated correlation energies of big systems, this is really not useful. The other way of doing CI is to do complete active space. So in this case, instead of truncating the interactions by how many excitations, what you do is you severely limit the number of states that you consider in the full CI. So if I may, may go back, let's say that here you have 100 states. So full CI would be a combinatorial number where M is at least 100. CAS CI, complete active space CI, is the idea that instead of doing 100, why I, I can just do eight, let's say, to choose a number. So you do full CI, but only on eight states, basically. The combinatorial number is still combinatorial, but now it's still combinatorial with an M of eight, which is something you can actually afford. And you can show that the correlation, the, the, the contribution to correlation decays with how high you go in, in, in your spectrum. So typically, by cons especially in very strongly correlated cases, all the strong correlation is centered on the bottom of the state of the, of the ladder. So typically, and CAS CI is, CAS, uh, complete active space is a very important concept because it allows you to, to resolve strongly correlated states by just by doing an exact calculation, but on a very limited basis of, of states. Anyway, so I'll come back to this because we are going to need this on the, ex on the, uh, on the tutorials and, and, and it, it's directly relevant to the way we do multi-determinant calculations. So electronic correlation. Uh, this is something that I if your background is in solid state, it's typically seen slightly different. But in, in chemistry, uh, they, 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 they whenever you work with many body physics, there's a, they make a very clear distinction about the type of correlation that, that a system could have. And, and it's typically divided into what they call static and dynamic. You should realize that this has nothing to do with time whatsoever. So I it's not really, the dynamical part is not related to time. It's related to, uh, I, I, I will show in the next slide what it's related to, but basically fine. static correlation is the idea that you have very important determinants. So when you're doing your CI expansion, let's say that this expansion contains a billion terms, and, and you start looking at the, at, the co at the coefficients of each determinant, how important each determinant is. So the Hartree fog in a system where typically, if, if you have a system that's not strongly correlated, that by definition means that you have a very important reference state, that Hartree fog is a good representation of your system. So in weakly correlated systems, the coefficient of the Hartree fog is 98, 99%. So the, the only thing you're doing, but the, the correlation rely, lies on this remaining sort of 1% of, of, the, of the weight of the wave function that the Hartree fog doesn't contain. But what happens when you don't have a single important determinant where let's say Hartree fog is now slightly smaller, 80%, and you have four other states that are very high compared to everything else. That if you were to plot all their coefficients, there would be clearly three, four, some small number of determinants that clearly stand out then that means that you cannot use Hartree fog as your sole reference in perturbation theory because you need all the other, Hartree fog is not the only important determinant, there are more important determinants. And uh, it doesn't have to be a small number. Extreme correlation is actually defined as the limit where you have a number of important determinants that scales with the system size. So it's not just a few, you have a really large number and they're all equally important. There's no one unique state that you can call important because you have many, 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 many of them and they're all equally important. Anyway, so going back to this, static correlation is the idea that you might have more than one important determinant. Uh, so the system is not statically correlated when Hartree fog is the only state by definition. Uh, typically when you start doing bond breaking, for example, this is a typical case in molecule. If you, if you take two hydrogen atoms and you start pulling them apart, and you see whenever you do a configuration interaction calculation, the weight of the Hartree Fox determinant, it goes from basically being 99, some 99% at equilibrium to effectively being not, uh, not being in the wave function at all. So the, the, the weight of the reference determinant dies, goes to zero, and then you start having a, a, a number of determinants that become crucially important. In H2, for example, there are two important configurations at equilibrium and, and only one important configuration. So the one at infinity and one important configuration at equilibrium. The only way to solve this is to devise a, a 
a, a sort of an, you have to investigate on which orbitals which orbitals are incorporated into these important determinants, and then you have to do a much better solution, including all of these determinants, basically. So dynamic correlation to first order is everything else. If you were to do an a, a, a calculation where you only include the important determinants that would capture static correlation, everything else is lumped into dynamic correlation. So dynamic correlation is van der Waals, for example. Dynamic correlation is any correlation coming from short range. The fact that when two electrons come close together, a mean field solution doesn't know about electronic distances. It only has one electron at a time. So when two electrons got close together in the real wave function, there is a lot that has to happen in the wave function to keep these two electrons apart. Uh, so all of the correlations that come in from, from these short range interactions of electrons is, is, is considered dynamic correlation. And there are other sources of dynamic correlation, but by far these are the two most important ones. So it, th the way I say it, the way I think about this is dynamic correlation is the contribution of an exponentially large number of unimportant determinants. So on its own, each determinant is somewhat irrelevant, but when you put an exponentially large number of them together, they all contribute to the remaining piece of the correlation energy. Uh, so this leads us nicely to, to the discussion on, on Jastrow functions. Uh, like I mentioned before, we always write the wave function as a product of some sort of anti-symmetric piece, which in this case is the simplest case, just a product of two determinants, and uh, the exponential of a Jastrow. And in this Jastrow, we put directly correlation be direct correlation between electrons. You can show, and maybe I should have done this, that uh, explicitly that th whenever two electrons get too close together, right where they are one on top of each other, the wave function has to have a very particular property. And this comes out of the Schrodinger equation. This is built in in the Schrodinger equation and it's completely independent of, of the system, of it's completely independent of everything, of the type of atoms. Depends only on the fact that the Coulomb potential is the interaction between two electrons. And the way you derive this, for example, is actually quite simple. If you go to a spherical representation, uh, you would see that there is a term that diverges in the, in the kinetic energy, which has to exactly cancel the divergence in the potential. The potential is diverging. We know that because it's 1 over r. So there has to be exactly a, the same term up here in the kinetic energy. And uh, it leads to this condition, which is, which is typically called the Cato cusp condition. And it means that the logarithmic derivative at the coincidence point between two particles has to have a very specific value. In the case of unequal spins, it's a half. In the case of equal spins, it's a fourth. And in the case of electron and ion, it's the, the nuclear charge. And so in, in this, uh, depends on how you actually define yeah, the, the yeah. <laughs> depends on how you actually define the, the gesture. But anyway, so anyway, the minus sign is it's conventional thing, actually. Actually, no, I made a mistake. Yes, that's completely right. So if we go, if you look at this figure, which now it's taken from a paper by Andreas Grunais, and uh, I like the figure very much, they are doing, in this case, MP2 calculation. So MP2 is the lowest level of perturbation theory that actually incorporates electron-electron interactions directly. And, uh, and they are looking at the first order wave function as a function of the distance between two ions, two electrons, sorry. And uh, they are doing this as a function of the basis set. So remember, this this means that the logarithmic derivative has a cusp that depending on which side you are going they're both going and they're forming a cusp you can see it's very hard to see so maybe you want to look on the side the exact wave function is perfectly picked it has the cusp any finite basis set is trying to reconstruct this cusp but you are reconstructing the cusp out of functions that don't know anything about distance so you're doing this in, I mean, you're doing this linear combination of all of these smooth functions and trying to generate something that's sharp. And this is the origin of, of dynamic correlation from the point of view of reproducing short range pr pr uh, properties. Uh, the number of plane waves that you need to do the, uh, the to recover the cusp, and this is doing uh, vast calculations, they went all the way to something like 15,000 plane waves, and they're still very far from reproducing the cusp. Doesn't matter how many you put, you will never actually recover the cusp, only on the limit of an infinite basis set. So the, the, the beauty about Monte Carlo is that we can put the cusp exactly on the wave function. So we can recover all the correlation energy related to the recovery of this short range electron-electron interaction directly on the wave function. And, and that way we recover a lot of dynamic correlation. Um, so like I say, in deterministic methods, this is extremely hard to treat. 
because uh, you have to put all of these things uh, basically by, by, by single body functions. So if you think about it, the reason why the correlation energy decays so slowly with basis set is exactly encapsulated here. You can think of this as all different basis sets, for example, in chemistry. All you're trying to do when you are doing the correlation, uh, the, the basis set extrapolation, is trying to capture the correlation energy related to the fact that you cannot really quite get this peak right. And there are some methods now, explicitly correlated methods, that address this issue, and they, they're actually quite fantastic, but uh, the, 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 the big problem in, in the case of basis set extrapolation is trying to get this divergency, this cusp, quite uh, right with a finite basis set. Uh, the, the, the form of the Jastrow factor, uh, and I think this has been mentioned several times, is very generic. You typically have uh, generic in, in terms of, as you can go as high as the coder is willing to, to do it, uh, you can have electron ion terms, uh, electron electron terms, electron electron ion terms, and you can basically keep going. Uh, basically keep going means that uh, the code QMC pack stops at these three terms. So we have electron ion, electron electron, and two electrons and one ion at a time. There are, there's one code that I'm aware of that would go all the way to four electrons at a time, and that's Turbo Mo by Sandro Sorella. And I believe that Casino has three electrons at a time. Uh, but Basically, that's beyond the, the, what we have done. This is typically what gets done, and it's relevant for some particular things, uh, especially if you want to look at strong dispersion, for example, then putting more electrons might be relevant. Uh, but for almost everything, uh, stopping here is actually quite, quite good. And the cost actually starts getting quite heavy. So each one of these terms is, is completely general. We, we expand it uh, in an arbitrary basis set, and the whole point is uh, effectively to use optimization to recover the optimum form for this. Uh, so for example, I, th they all look the same. It is it's some sort of expansion on a, on a basis set, like I mentioned, and then the dependence on the coordinates would be like that. Uh, the typically, then, the only thing you need to specify is what's the basis set of the expansion. And uh, OK, I do say something about this. So. Uh, if you look at all the quantum chemistry, uh, quantum Monte Carlo codes in, in the world, typically there's a lot of flexibility here. You can do exponents, you can do, so you would get the exponent of an exponent, which is very hard to optimize actually. You get things like Gaussians, you can get polynomials, a any really basis set would work. In practice, um, there are three very popular uh, fun forms, uh, which is the Pade form. The Pade form has, is particularly appealing because this, uh, you can determine, it's already, it goes to the right limits, you can think of, at short and at long distances. Uh, but it's somewhat restrictive if you really want full freedom. So typically people either do polynomials that have this form. In QMC pack, all of these things are implemented, actually. Uh, but we strongly recommend it, and, and by we, I mean I, the use of piece planes. And I don't agree, if, I don't know if everybody agrees with me, but uh, I think by far in, in the code, this is wh what most people use, and the idea is that now you don't really specify basis functions. You, you use a numerical grid almost. You define how many points along the radial axis you want. And the actual value of the wave function at these points, uh, of the gesture at these points, gets optimized directly. Uh, this would look like it would be complicated if the optimization wasn't robust. But it, it actually works very well. So for example, I have case uh, of, of the gesture that you will be calculating later today in the, for a water molecule. In this case, you have your one body term. So this is the oxygen, the electron oxygen, and this is the electron hydrogen gesture. And what actually the functions are, and this would be, sorry, the electron electron. This would be for up and down electrons, and this would be for up, up, and down, down electrons. And you can see how it's, it's very smooth. And what I actually am optimizing is the value of the gesture at, at multiple points. And with six, seven, eight iterations of the optimization cycle, you get functions that are this smooth. So basically, we recommend the use of the numerical basis. Then it's not limited to what form of the basis function you're using. It would automatically relax to wherever it wants to go. Uh, yes? Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm just plotting the, the J in this case. Right. So the positive number is going to start increasing. Uh, the second function, the J2. This guy? Yeah. So that's going to go 
Oh, we usually have the commit center go through Sita. No, it has to oh, go to Sita. Well, no, you can see it's tapering off to Sita. So far away, they are not correlated. This is this is the limit. So actually, this plane, the, the, the one thing, the, 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 con the condition is that at the n plus one point, it, it's forced to go to zero with zero derivative. So it constrains the shape down here, yeah. So sorry, I forgot to say that it has to go to zero, yeah. And you can see that it goes to zero also here, which means that at yesterday, it has to go like one over r to zero, right? Right, so in a solid, yeah. this, this is the short range piece of the gesture in a solid, and I did forget to say this, I'll go to you, sorry. So Yes. Yeah. So for this particular form, so that's what I'm saying. So uh, this is considered a short range gesture. So if you look at the gesture, much of the complexity is at short distances. This is the part that's harder to optimize. So what we do is we break it up in two. Uh, so in, in solids, this is particularly relevant. In molecules, it's not quite. But in solids, for example, you can break it up into you can have a piece in real space which would take care of the short piece. This piece has to go to zero at some cutoff distance. The cutoff is something that you get to decide. So, so you can make a cutoff much larger than the molecule, for example, and then you do all the ranges. In a solid, you cannot do this. So you have some finite range in the real piece, and then you have the remaining long range piece on a k-space gesture. So we also have a, a form of the gesture that looks like this, but now this expansion is over e uh, plane waves, over e to the i k dot r. And, what, and, and then the whole thing is done in Fourier space. I, I forgot to put it in here, mainly because we're talking about molecules, but in solids, uh, you can take care of the long range piece by, by doing the gesture in K space instead of real space. So uh, if I want to have a long, uh, larger, larger cover of radius, you want to use different, uh, another form of extension or other basis of time? No, so in, in QMC pack, uh, you, you define two things in the input file. You define the range and how many points along, this is a numerical grid, so you define how many points in that radio grid. And uh, if you need to do much larger cutoff because your molecule is much bigger, then you can increase the cutoff and you can increase the number of points in your numerical grid, basically. We typically use something like 10, but uh, basically it's very system dependent. So, I mean, sorry, it's not system dependent, but if you want to do something that's quite different from the average, then, then you might have to, to test. Uh, possibilities. Typically, I have done quite large molecules and, and 10, 12 variation of parameters along the way are, are enough. And at some point, the, the correlation dies away, so you don't, you don't have to use 100, you know, bores. Uh, you know, you typically, something like 10 bores is usually good enough, I would say. Forgot to say, uh, here, uh, this figure is quite important. And we're actually going to regenerate it in the lab today. Uh, the idea is that each time we put a term on the gastro, it makes a significant contribution to the wave function and to the energy. So in this case, again, this is a prototypical H2O molecule that we're going to be playing with later today. If you just put the one body, so you take a Slater determinant from Hartree-Fock, and you just put this term, at this point there is no electron-electron correlation actually. Uh, so this is the error that you're making with respect to, to the exact answer. Uh, and of course the error is very large. If you just put the two-body interaction, there is a significant decrease in the error, but it's still quite large. Uh, so this would be, I would consider, the minimum level that you would do. Actually, the minimum level is typically putting both one and two-body gestures. The reason why you want a one-body gesture is because this compensates for the deficiencies of your basis set. So even if you use a really poor basis set in chemistry, where you would have a huge error in a quantum chemistry calculation, by putting a one-body term, you can cure most of the deficiencies on the basis set. So by the time you have one and two body terms, the, the error in the energy is greatly reduced. If you now put the three body term, then you start including more complex correlation into the, into the wave function. And, and then you get actually quite close to the, to the DMC solution. Uh, I'm not going to say too much because we're going to see this on, on the tutorial, but basically the DMC in principle should be independent of all of this, by the way. Um, So there could be a connection, a self-consistency. Yeah. So that's one. The other the thing I'm, I'm thinking is it's in principle because the systematics also depend. Yeah. So you have to make sure you clean up all the systematics to really see complete independence. But uh, maybe getting ahead. So 
a quick survey of Slater Jastrow uh, results. Uh, there is, of course, by far, I would say over 90, 95% of all the QMC calculations use the Slater Jastrow. In your calculations, you should always start here, of course, unless there's a huge amount of, of data that, you can, that, that has been done in the past and you know what the dependence is going to be. If you have your own problem, you should always do a, a simple Slater Jastrow calculation to begin with. And uh, in the code, you can use one and two body, and, and you should use three body, actually, if, if you have no issues with optimization. So uh, this is just a, a very small two actual, only two calculations done with Slater Jastrow, and it's meant more as an illustration. There are way too many things to, to show. Uh, the, for example, the, the study of the first version of the G2 test set, these are 55 molecules, small molecules, two to three atoms, all first and second row. And the idea is to look at the binding energies of these molecules. So you would calculate the energy of the molecular equilibrium, and you would subtract away the energy of the independent atoms. And then you want to see how well you're doing at reproducing the, the, fa the, the binding energy. Uh, and this is work done by uh, people from the Casino Group, uh, Richard Nitz and uh, Nemec, uh, in 2010. And you can see that uh, well the, the change, the variation in accuracy, I, I didn't really put the names, but basically these are 55 numbers representing all 55 molecules. And the, the value oscillate roughly between plus minus five, and this is in KCAL. Uh, if you, this is using a single Slater determinant with a just throw and containing one, two, and three body terms, and everything is fully optimized. So this gives you some rough idea of what's the expected accuracy of a Slater Jastrow at, at this particular type of interaction. So, so in a sense, the, the G2 set is somewhat str a strong test, if you think about it, because you're breaking completely apart a molecular bond. And this is usually the, the strongest energy scale in the system is a covalent bond, which you're completely breaking. So we end up with an accuracy of roughly, uh, I would say, the, the mean absolute e deviation, which is with the experiment, because we know the experimental numbers for all of this. I think it's somewhere very close to three kcals per mole, which is which is on which is actually quite good. Uh, couple cluster, for example, if if you do a basis extrapolation and you are very careful in doing everything on the couple cluster well, it would give you a mean absolute deviation of like a kcal, one something very close to one kcal. QMC is somewhere around three. DFT, uh, I didn't show results, but DFT would be anywhere between two and a half kcals and 40 kcals, depending on which functional you're using. Uh, of course, density functional theory for molecules is, is much more evolved than density functional theory for solids. If your background is in solid state physics, uh, typically you know LDA and PBE. These are the canonical standard functionals uh, in, in, in solid state. Uh, hybrids were introduced in solid state somewhere 2006, I would believe, uh, by Gustavo Cusseria, uh, maybe a little bit before that actually, 2004. But hybrids have existed in chemistry since 19, since the very early 90s by Becky. So uh, solid state physics is lagging behind chemistry functions by something like 10 to 15 years. So the, the way you can get density functional theory to be quite accurate for a G2 set, for example, but it's, it's not really density functional theory anymore. You have to do, you have to include Hartree Fock, you have to include range separation, you have to include uh, MP2. So you typically have to introduce a lot of features from wave function theory into density functional theory to really get very accurate solutions. Uh, you can do this for molecules, actually, for solids. Like I said, we are kind of 15 years behind. So all of these things that make uh, DFT very accurate, and why I say DFT is this generalized DFT very accurate for the system would eventually make it into solids, but probably you know 10 years uh, down the road. And uh, if you just do your bread and butter functionals, like LDA has a mean absolute error of 40 kcals in this case. So LDA is kind of terrible at binding molecules if, if you want accurate solutions. PBE, I believe, is something like 20, so it's much better than LDA, but still nowhere near good enough for chemists to look at. Actually, in, in a sense, you get a huge improvement in the result when you put hybrid exchange. And this is the reason why DFT became so popular in chemistry. Before the introduction of hybrid exchange, DFT was considered just not accurate enough to do chemistry. With hybrids, you get somewhere close to what they would consider accurate enough. And then if you do much more to the functional, you can actually get 
pretty reasonable solutions, which are not cheap anymore because you have to basically do uh, some sort of advanced many body method to correct DFT. But uh, in DFT, all, all I'm trying to say is that in, at least in quantum chemistry, DFT is, is you know, 10 years ahead than what it is in solids. Uh, so eventually all of those things will make it into solid state and it would uh, be very interesting. QMC would remain at this level of accuracy also in solids because like I'm saying, this is the absolute simplest level of theory that we are using. So this is putting a Slater, fr a sl a Slater wave function from, from mean field and sticking a gesture. And we're already quite close to, to the best you can do in, in quantum chemistry. So this is uh, very appealing uh, for molecules, but of course in solids is really where the, the interest lies. So if you look now at a weaker type of interaction, something that's not quite as strong as a, as a covalent bond, as breaking a covalent bond, and that would be looking at the S22, molecules in the S22 test set. Um, these are basically, we're looking now at, at molecules uh, bound together by weak dispersion forces. So the molecules re themselves remain intact, and what you're calculating is the energy, for example, of having the dissociation energy of a water molecule. So there's no covalent bond between two body water molecules, it's just hydrogen bonding, and then you're breaking that hydrogen bond apart. Or you have something like uh, two benzene rings, and you're seeing how they stack uh, together. So in this case, DFT is really terrible at doing weak dispersion forces. Uh, there's a recent paper by, uh, I don't forget his name, uh, Tubeki, but Lubo Schmidt, is, sorry? Uh, so no, uh, his first name, uh, anyway. So Dubeki, of course, um, Lubo Schmitas and, and, and company using uh, QWOC, I believe, where they show that l they, they took a subset, so the S22 set has 22 molecules, of course. They took a subset of the S22 uh, test set, I believe nine molecules, and they compared the binding energy. And the difference between the QMC and the CCSD numbers are within 0.1 keiko per mole. This is their, their actual results. Uh, I just took this from their paper. And you can see that this is the difference between the best couple cluster that can be done. And by best, I mean you kind of have to be an expert in the basis of extrapolation because it's extremely delicate. But if you, if you take this from the best people and you compare it against QMC, you're roughly on average 0.1 keiko away from the results. Uh, if you look on the same S22 test set, for example, and let's just assume for now that couple cluster CCSD T parenthesis T at the CBS limit is, is the reference, which is, it, it, I think it can be done in this case. PBE, for example, is two and a half K calls away, uh, which for the magnitude of these interactions is actually quite, quite, a, quite a bit. Uh, if you put a hybrid on this type of interactions that you're doing PBE zero, it doesn't change by much. So if you put a hybrid at the, up here, the, the, the improvement is dramatic. You go from 20 to something like five or six uh, because the, the covalent bonding is, is quite different. At dispersion, exchange is not doing anything for you for dispersion. Um, dispersion is a, is a high order quantum effect. So mean field really cannot capture it. The only way that you can get dispersion in many body physics, in, sorry, in mean field theory is, is kind of by faking it. You have to put a term in there that accounts for the fact that your mean field simply cannot handle this. So what's typically done, it's called uh, dispersion corrected functionals. The, the easiest and the simplest of this is Grimes approach. Uh, it's called, there are several formulations, so D3 is the third evolution of this correction. And, and it, what it basically does, it, it adds a term that decays as R to the minus six by hand and then you fit the coefficients to, to give you back reasonable answers. So actually the fits are done by minimizing the error on this S22 says, test set typically. That's how it was done in the past. And you can see that most of the error in describing dispersion interactions is because the, this term, I mean the decay at long distances is very poor in mean field. So you can go from an error of 2.5 to an error of roughly a half by, by basically adding these corrections. But these corrections are completely non-empirical at this point. Uh, how to properly account for dispersion interactions in mean field this is a very big active area of development. There are three or four choices. Some work better, some uh, depending on the system. But, but in all, if what you want to describe is this weak binding, then this, this is extremely important. And if you are in the biological uh, field, for example, everything is bound weakly. So DFT would be quite terrible for any, any molecular, large conglomerate of, molecular, of molecules, basically. Uh, if you think about uh, another alternative, bitter leap, for example, bitter leap is actually quite accurate for the G2 set. It's mean absolute deviation is below eight, I believe, uh, but for binding, it's actually quite bad. 
So then you get into this problem that what you get depends completely on what functional you're using. If you correct bitrelib, then you get a pretty reasonable solution back. But of course, you have to do corrections for all of these things, and you don't know ahead of time. Uh, so these results are not published right now. Uh, we have calculations on the full S22 tested. Again, just using uh, first, I would say, best practices, which is we generate a recipe. We take a Slater determinant from some orbitals from down here. We stick a Jastro, and we optimize. Do nothing else. The simplest that can be done and what you should also be doing if you were to do uh, these calculations. And we get a mean absolute deviation with respect to couple cluster of 0 0.22, 27, when we include all 22 molecules, which, of course, uh, the agreement here was much better because the molecules that were chosen were probably the simplest ones. But if you include everything, uh, the, the agreement gets a little bit worse, but it's not so terrible. And remember, we're still at this later Jastro level. Uh, if you were to do better with functions, for example, multi-determinants or backflow or something like that, you can cut this back to this level uh, for, for the test set like this. Should we stop now? I think this is a, a good breaking point if 